So last year, around the same time, it was mid-September, I spoke on the same stage to probably the same group here, and I've been in the week or in the job eight days. Okay. And General Murray signed me up for this when I was still in Japan. He said, don't worry about it. It's a friendly audience. And so I spoke then with uh, the confidence of someone that had no idea, okay, what he was talking about. Uh, today, I've been in the seat just over a year, <clears throat> and I must admit there are still days I feel like I'm realizing the Peter principle in this job. However, I do feel much better grounded today than a year ago, and I'd like to share with you today what I'm seeing on the direction of the Army as far as modernization, from, primarily from a resourcing perspective, but perhaps from some other uh, aspects too. I have found though, uh, as I've been in the G8 for the last year, I've become very attracted to country music and Dear Abby columns, <laughs> as uh, they both center on being done wrong by somebody else, and it just makes you feel better about your own life as a G8 when you listen to that country music and Dear Abby. <laughs> so I was up in Philly a week ago, hometown, and, uh, and I was checking out Dear Abby column, there uh, that I, again, I like to read these days, and so I'd like to share it with you. It says, Dear Abby, I've never written to you before, but I really need your advice. I have suspected for some time now that my wife has been cheating on me. The usual signs, phone rings, but, uh, but if I answer, the caller hangs up. My wife has been going out with, quote, the girls a lot recently, although when I ask their, her their names, she always says, just some friends from work, you don't know them. I always try to stay awake to look out for her coming home, but I get up early for work and usually fall asleep before she gets home. Anyway, I've, ne I've never approached the subject with my wife. I think deep down, I just don't want to know the truth. But last night, she went out again and I decided to really check on her. Around midnight, I decided to hide in the garage behind my golf clubs so I could get a good view of the whole street when she arrived home from another night out with the girls. It was at that moment, crouching behind my clubs, contemplating what my marriage meant to me, thinking about the impact on our children. And at that point, I noticed a graphite shaft on my driver appeared to have a hairline crack right near the club head. Is this something I can fix myself, or should I take it back to the pro shop where I bought it? Signed, <laughs> perplexed. <laughs> So someone who's happily married for a long time and an avid golfer, I think this guy has his priorities just about right. <laughs> All right, so listen, uh, I'll start with a couple of disclaimers and j jump right into it. I'm going to share everything I know uh, and can share right now, but you, do mu you must realize PB20 is sitting on the hill. We're not quite close with that. Conferencing is going on right now. We do anticipate a short CR. So I'll tell you what I can on that right now, but again, there's still work to be done there before an appropriation. We just did uh, send down the hall uh, Palm Best 21 about a month ago to OSD. Uh, we've just begun program budget review, and so the OSD has the pen right now, and so I can tell you what I know about it, but it's gonna be pretty limited. Uh, so that's what I, you know, when I get to 20 and 21, I have those restrictions there. So this morning, I would like to bring you, though, up to date on what's been happening on the modernization front and equipping front for the U.S. Army uh, where, and where we're heading in the future primarily uh, from a resourcing perspective. And I look forward to your questions at the end. I know, Sydney, you're out here. I heard some. I got a spot report, so I'll be ready. <laughs> <clears throat> so where have we been? So I, and I won't recount the NDS. You've heard it multiple times. I won't get into the details of that. I'll assume everybody knows the, what's in that. I will say it continues to be the defining document that's driving a lot of activity inside the Pentagon. I would like to outline what we've done fiscally in the Army to set a path toward what I'll call future readiness. Note, and I, I'll focus on that term future readiness. Uh, readiness, when we think about it conceptually, has a present day connotation, and that really is what General Milley's focus was on when he became the chief, is to get the Army ready to fight tonight. But future readiness is the ability to effectively operate in the anticipated future environment that we see in multi-domain operations. And with that in mind, uh, I'll take a review of what we've done and where I think we will do to support future readiness. So in FY18, when the NDS did come out in January of that year, a fundamental change in priorities and uh, directions for the department took place. And rather than wait for next year's budget to adjust the priorities of the NDS, the Army acted by requesting a $1 billion reprogramming. 
uh, through an ATR, which Congress approved, which we were very grateful. And this programming, uh, programming action enabled the Army into what I'll call, we prime the future readiness pump. And that's kind of the bumper sticker for FY18 on what we did on resourcing. That $1 billion that we uh, were allowed to reprogram from Congress, we added $51 million right up front, which is soon after the uh, NDS came out to support long-range precision fires. $12 million for the network, $50 million for NGCV, the next generation combat vehicle, $156 million for soldier lethality, and most importantly, half of that, over $550 million, went to IVAS, uh, the, what we called heads-up display back then. Those priming that pump has it set to where we are today uh, that I'll talk about in a bit. Also that year in FY18, we cut the ribbon on Army Futures Command, led by, uh, commanded today by General Mike Murray, who sat in my seat uh, back a couple of years, uh, over, just over a year ago. So that was FY18. FY19, the year got off to a great start, thanks to Congress passing an appropriation and the President signing uh, the bill into law for the first time in over a decade. And this has enabled the Army and the entire Department of Defense uh, to more efficiently and wisely obligate funds over the course of the entire year, as opposed to the frantic and inefficient spending that takes place usually about this time to get the year-end closeout after we've had an extended CR. Uh, so following with that as a start into the year, I would call FY19 as we, uh, after priming the future readiness front, front in 18, I will call FY19 setting the azimuth for future readiness. Specifically, the Army invested about $5 billion in the Army modernization priorities that were established in FY18. By adopting, uh, adapting existing programs and funding RDT&E for new development of those programs at uh, those six modernization priorities. Additionally, earlier this, summer, earlier this summer, we cut the ribbon on Army Futures Command as far as FOC, I should say. So although they're still trying to ramp up to their civilian personnel strength, uh, a AFC today is doing what was envisioned a couple of years ago when they got and they whiteboarded it out. And it's really getting their feet under them and making a difference on the future of our Army. AFC right now is in, uh, here in FY19. They're putting the last touches on the, new, the updated Army modernization strategy being developed by Lieutenant General Eric Wesley, a good friend down in Army and Futures, con Futures and Concepts. And as opposed to our past modernization efforts or, or documents that focus just on the materiel part of it, equipment, this new modernization strategy that I, I hope will be out and we'll roll it out at AUSA perhaps, I'm not sure, uh, we'll take the whole Dotland PF uh, look at modernization, you know, starting with doctrine, organization, et cetera, all wrapped in together for a synchronized uh, look at modernizing the Army beyond just the equipment that I talked about a second ago. A consistent question I get from you, I think I've gotten it from Sidney in the past or one of his cohorts, is what is the relationship like today between G8 and AFC regarding requirements? Uh, and recently, we worked that out here in FY19. A couple of months ago, out at a conference in, in Maryland, sat down with General Murray and the Chief, Jim Richardson, and we worked through that. So in, in essence, for requirements, the Chief continues to be the ultimate approval uh, authority for Army requirements. But he will delegate to the Vice and the AFC commander uh, certain requirements to approve, and they will chair AROCs at the Chief's direction. The G8 will continue to manage the requirements process and run two and three star staffings and I will kind of organize and run the AROCs. So that in essence is how we've uh, worked out the relationship and it's actually starting to get its feet under them after a couple of uh, dry runs. Finally, in FY19, as I think you all know, the DOD is in the midst of setting the senior leadership positions across the Department of Defense. The good news is that Secretary McCarthy and General McConville have been partners as the under and the vice for the last couple of years. So there's a level of trust and confidence between them and, and also an alignment of their vision for the future of the Army that we've not seen in perhaps other transitions uh, uh, that were similar. Secretary McCarthy had his confirmation hearing last Thursday. We think it went well, but he's not quite yet confirmed that vote still has to take place sometime hopefully in the near future. 
Importantly, though, Secretary McCarthy and General McConville have said publicly that there will be no change to the six modernization priorities under their watch. One final data point for FY19 that's of note. Last uh, FY, the Army took a good bit of heat for missing out on our recruiting and end strength goals. Although this isn't modernization, it's worth talking about just for a second because the Chief and the Secretary went public on this yesterday, and if you didn't hear it, uh, we, uh, uh, we've made our, our recruiting goals for this year. We established it at 68,000, and we're going to come in over that, thanks to a lot of hard work out there across the Army to make that happen. We're pretty confident, too. We're very confident we're going to make our end strength goals. I don't know exactly where that's going to land, but uh, it's going to be over what was uh, 478 was the active component end strength, and we're going to come in over that. So that's good news, and uh, uh, that thanks to a lot of hard work across the Army. So let's shift to FY20. That's just around the corner on the calendar here. So if FY18 was priming the future readiness pump, FY19 was setting the azimuth for future readiness, I'll call FY20 placing a big bet on future readiness. So some of you know these numbers already. I talked about them around town a good bit once it became out in public, but it's significant enough to repeat here. As PB20 is still on the hill and the number aren't quite finalized yet, uh, there's still some play, free play out there, but they, the numbers are, again, worth repeating. Right now, in, in FY20, we plan on investing uh, $8.6 billion in our modernization priorities just in that year alone, a 78% in increase compared to what was, what was planned when we started uh, a year ago for this year in the PB19. And if you compare the two FIDEPs, PB19 and PB20 FIDEPs, we are investing $57 billion across those similar years, 20 to 24. Uh, that's a 137% uh, increase from the FIDEP a year earlier. That is uh, $33 billion additionally that we found through the deep dive process that I won't go into a whole lot of detail here on, that we found from around the Army to uh, bump up, place that big bet on future readiness. <clears throat> As I mentioned, over, and over half of that $33 billion was from the equipping portfolio. Paul Ostrowski, I see here, was a partner in that as we uh, scrubbed all of the programs across the Army. Over 180 programs, 186 to be uh, specific, were either eliminated or reduced. In a broad sense, these decisions within the Army have been supported by members of Congress and their staffs. There are a program or two that we continue to have a dialogue with, with Congress and others. But beyond that, we foresee just about all of our adjustments in MPB 20 being supported as the rationale was solid and it supports the direction of the national defense strategy. Uh, there was also some good news a couple months ago with the two-year budget agreement with Congress. So the DOD top lines of 738, $738 billion in FY20 and $741 billion in FY21 were agreed upon. Uh, we've heard rumor of a short-term CR in FY20 that will allow Congress the time to work the appropriation. And as long as the CR is kept to a couple of months, it won't drastically affect Army readiness. However, there are about a couple of dozen or so new starts, new research, and production increases that would be affected under a two- or three-month uh, CR. And these number, its numbers increase over time if it would drag on into the new calendar year. So let's look at FY21, start and look a little bit deeper. So again, if FY18, there's going to be a test at the end of this. I keep repeating this, okay? If we were prime the future readiness pump in 18 and we set the azimuth for future readiness in 19, we placed a big bet on future readiness in 20. FY21, I would call doubling down on future readiness. Palm 2125, again, which we just sent down to haul the OSD, it will, continues to support the national defense strategy and it will fully fund our six modernization pro, uh, priorities. That's what we sent down the hall. Again, we are in just starting the program budget review and all that with uh, OSD. We did conduct a second deep dive, and again, Paul was my wingman on that at the three-star level. And the current SecDef, then the Secretary of the Army, and the current Chairman, General Milley, are the ones that approved our Palm 21 that uh, is down the hall. Um, inside the EE peg, or the equipping peg, that I manage for the two co-chairs, which are General Milley, or correction, General Murray and Dr. Jetty, 
Uh, we did, again, take a hard look at all the programs across the uh, equipping portfolio, and the guidance was the same as it was the year before. Look for efficiencies in the equipping programs uh, in order to resource the modernization priorities uh, within a steady Army top line. The screening criteria was the same as the year before. Look at those that have little or nothing to do with lethality. Look at uh, those that uh, we don't think will be effective in the future operating environment we foresee in 2028 under the multi-domain operations concept. And also look at programs that perhaps we can slow down a little bit under acceptable risk. So I won't get into the details of the number, but there were a number of programs that were affected under that screening criteria that we submitted down to OSD for their review. So let's talk Palm 22 even a little bit deeper. Now, if you want know, a little more thinner ice here to talk about in the future, but I'll share what I think. Uh, first, I think the planning of it is off to a great start. Uh, thanks to Lieutenant General Charlie Flynn and the G3 team, that it's going to get, I think, TAA 22, a lot of the big decisions done ahead of the programming part of it. Often we have the cart in front of the horse and we're starting programming and we haven't gotten TAA decisions. This year, we're going to get some uh, TAA or uh, Total Army Analysis decisions on where we want to change things in the Army structure-wise to inform the programming. So that's a great start to Palm 22 already. The Palm offsite will be in December, and we're already ramping up for that. And this is the opportunity for our Army senior leadership to provide their priorities and guidance to build the POM. And so this is conjecture on my part, but I think what follows is some of the guidance we're going to hear uh, on, uh, from them come January when we start in earnest to pull together that program 22-26. First, I think people initiatives will be priority prioritized. If you've heard General McConville, his number one priority is people. And he's defined that in various ways. And so I don't think it's huge bills, but it'll be prioritized that we have to go uh, put money against based on what our new chief has said is important to him personally. I think we're going to continue to resource near-term readiness uh, to ensure we meet our global requirements and not plan requirements. We are not walking away from the readiness of our soldiers to be ready to fight tonight and to support what our combatant commanders need globally. I think we're going to continue to resource uh, fully resource our modernization priorities. That's consistent with what they both said publicly, and I'm confident that's the guidance we'll get moving into Palm 2226. And then we'll look for, uh, I think we're going to continue to look for efficiencies and some kind of reforms across the Army to try and pay our bills internally rather than put our hand out to OSD at the end of the Palm bill. So that's what I know and think about Palm 21 and 22, and to quote Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so I'll finish up with where we stand on uh, fielding some of our next generation capabilities and some concerns I have as the G8, and then we'll see if there's some questions. So over the uh, next few years, the Army will field a host of next generation capabilities. And to put things into perspective, between now and 2026, so the end of this program we're about to, to, uh, to embark on, that we'll be filling uh, 12 of those capabilities, and here's a glimpse of what's coming. And details afterwards, I'll point you to Paul Ostrowski if you want to know a little bit more. I'm just going to talk about timelines uh, in, in, rather than details. So in FY21, starting just over a little bit of a year from now, we'll begin fielding the integrated tactical network. And that'll be in two-year increments, 21, 23, 25 is the plan to roll that out to make sure we have the best comms capability, I'll just use that term, in the Army and get out in front of where we are today. We'll also begin fielding mobile SHORAD. We're getting back into short-range air defense and we'll start to see striker-mounted air defense capability in FY21. We'll also begin uh, fielding indirect fire uh, protection, IFPIC, we're buying a couple of uh, uh, Iron Dome batteries, and we'll be, that's the interim capability, and they'll be fielded in, in FY21. And then IBAS, the uh, in Individual Visual Augmentation System, we're partnering with Microsoft, and that starts to get fielding in FY21. An incredible capability if you haven't seen it. In FY23, we will field the next gen squad weapon rifle and, the next, uh, and also the next gen squad automatic rifle. Uh, they'll replace the M4 
and the saw in our combat units. Uh, not every soldier is going to end up with one of those, but the 100,000 that are in close combat will get field of that capability beginning in 27. Precision strike missile will, get for, will be first unit fielded. Again, that's an operational fires, uh, a part of the long range precision fire portfolio. Extended range cannon artillery will be again fielding in FY23 without an autoloader. And then the enduring capability for IFPIC will also be fielded in 23. And finally, a hypersonics battery will be fielded in FY23. Looking at 24, we'll field IRCA with an autoloader. And then in 25, we'll, be, we'll field the, start fielding the future tactical UAS. And in 26, we will begin fielding the optionally manned fighting vehicle, which is our Bradley replacement. So there's other things out a little bit deeper. It takes a long time to develop a helicopter. Uh, I know there are some of my friends from other, from that I saw here earlier on FLAR and FAR and stuff that's out there beyond the, the current problem we're working. So uh, finally, some observations as the G8 and some concerns I have that I'll just talk to you about. They're nothing I don't think are solvable, uh, but they are concerns as I sit in the job, in the seat I do today. First, our strategy right now assumes a top line that's fairly flat. I'm not sure that's a good assumption. So when the budget does go down, and we all know how it works around here, at some point it's going to go down, will we have the nerve to make the hard choices to protect future readiness? Often that's the first lever we pull. We try and protect end strength and uh, current readiness at the cost of future readiness. So that's one concern, again, as the G8. Even if we have a flat top line, our best scenario, we may, may need to have an appetite suppressant. As I've described before, there's three rheostats when you build a program. You have structure slash end strength, that's one rheostat. You have readiness, how ready do you want that structure to be? And then you have modernization or capital investments. And you can turn those rheostats one way or another. If you turn one hard, you're going to have to turn one or the others the other way under a steady flat top line to balance the program. So right now we want to uh, we're looking to have slow, measured growth of the Army, so we're turning that dial up a little bit. We want to keep the uh, Army highly ready, so we want to maybe not turn it up, but we're not going to turn it back. We want to keep it, at, once we get the Army ready, we want to sustain it. And then we want to turn the modernization dial pretty hard. So, I, and I just don't know if there's enough efficiencies and reforms under our steady top line to do all that. So those are some uh, choices we're going to have to put before the leadership uh, as we move through Palm 22 on how to balance the program under the description I just uh, made. We've already taken a couple of pretty good hard looks at the portfolio in deep dives. And if we take another third one at that, I'm not sure there's the efficiencies there, again, to fund what we see coming in this program. Uh, in FY22, if you know the Army strategy, the main effort shifts from readiness to modernization. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I've asked a couple times. I've heard a couple of theories. I think we need to clearly define that for everybody, both inside and outside the Army, as we work POM 22, and I think we will. We'll get some guidance from the leadership for that. I'm a bit concerned about the underappreciation under of the Army's role in the Pacific by some, especially given the Department of Defense's focus on China. Having served out there recently, both in Hawaii and Japan, I'm familiar with what the Army brings to the joint team in the Indo-Pacific. The Army is an indispensable joint partner, and where the Army is going with, in the future with long-range precision fires, AMD, or air missile defense, the network, and other capabilities we're investing in, the Army will remain vitally important in the future in the Indo-Pacific, both from a deterrence and warfighting perspective. Those that think a contingency operation in the Pacific is an Air Force and Navy fight are just simply wrong. And we'll require an it requires an integrated joint team in, to achieve our military objectives in the Pacific, with the Army playing a major role in every aspect of the operation. So finally, uh, while we have a fully funded CFT effort in Palm 2024, and we're going to fully, and I think we're going to continue to fully fund the CFTs or the, the modernization priorities. And I, I, we don't really have a clear picture of what those bills are right now. And the program is what we think they're going to be. But I think as we really transition from RDT&E to procurement, there's unrealized bills out there that we're going to have to figure out how to resource. 
And so, and so right now I think they're underestimated and we're gonna have to figure out how to find some dollars to fully fund them to stay in concert with the guidance that I think we're gonna get. So those are just a few observations and concerns I have. Uh, the good news is our Army leadership is ready, willing, and able to make those decisions and provide that guidance to provide, you know, set us on the path to, re to fix all those issues or address my personal concerns I have as the G8. And I know they are committed to the future readiness of the U.S. Army. So once again, thanks, General Ham and Wayne for sponsoring the breakfast today, for allowing me to come and speak again this year. And I'd like to take your questions at this time with whatever time we have left. Thank you. Sir, thank you for being here today. Uh, I'll kick things off. Sure. Uh, how can you work better with Congress to get consistent, predictable funding for the Army? Well, I, you know, I think our relationship with Congress is very good. I'll just say that right up front. Uh, we've been complimented by having a consistent strategy now for several years in a row rather than pinging all over the place. Um, and Congress, they know, they want that too. I don't think they're trying to end up with a CR. Um, and so I think, uh, again, if we have a short-term CR, it's going to be okay. Uh, we're not, we're not jumping off of buildings about that. So I, I think uh, our relationship with Congress, again, is very good. I think we're getting closer. We do have a budget agreement thanks to Congress and working with the president. So I think we're in a relatively speaking good place right now moving forward. Sydney. Hi, sir. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense, for those of you not long since sick of me. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let me ask um, two foreign looking questions. Uh, one, a while back, uh, then Undersecretary McCarthy said, you know, his pro look at preliminary figure for how much they'd be able, you'd be able to free up over tw the next POM, the 21-25, was about $10 billion, which is obviously a lot less than 33 but as you said, it's going to get harder each time. Uh, you know, is that figure, you know, still ballpark correct? Are you going to be able to beat that, or is it going to be struggle to reach that? The second half of this, which is, you know, we're seeing, well, you said a lot of acceptance of the 186 cuts. Uh, you know, Congress looks like they're adding back in the money for CH-47. Uh, so, you know, even if you can meet your goals and what you cut in your proposal, you know, is Congress going to actually let you execute those cuts, or is it going to be, you know, is the CH-47 thing, you know, a, a one-off or, you know, the beginning of a death by a thousand, well, not cuts, a thousand plus ops? Okay. One, correct the record. Today, as we sit here, Mr. Secretary McCarthy is actually the undersecretary of the Army because his nomination's on the Hill. He can't be acting secretary or anything. So it's just where we are in time, uh, just so we're all straight on that. Um, on the last one, on the CH-47 and the cuts, and, you know, there's been a lot of marks. We're going through the marks right now on that. There are ads in some places, reductions in others, and we're in the process of working with the staff up there on things we would like them to reconsider and work what we're okay with. In a general sense, I think we're, uh, in most instances, we think we're gonna land in a place we'll be comfortable with. Uh, Congress is, you know, again, supportive. When we went around, when I went with Secretary McCarthy uh, and talked to all the staffers before we rolled it out and, uh, and, and after, broad consensus that what the Army was doing was the right thing because it was based on the national defense strategy. Regardless of political party or House or Senate or whatever, there was not pushback on the rationale of what we were doing. There's all, and, and CH-47 is, is a good one, Sydney. that's the one. And that's one of the ones we've had a pretty good discussion. I know Tony Crutchfield is here and we've had dialogue. I flew up to the plant in, in Philadelphia uh, with Dr. Jetty and met with the Congress and the plant folks on that one. So that's an example of one that uh, we're continuing to work. I think we're going to land in a place where everybody's comfortable on that too. It's not what we asked for, but it's I think what we're going to have to work through with both Boeing, with uh, Congress, and with inside the Army. I think we'll be we'll be okay in the long run. The first part of the question was what? Again, Sydney, just prime me and then I'll. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
the target and everything, you know, I, I can't get in the numbers on that. We took a pretty hard swing in it. I can't, I honestly, sitting here, I don't remember where we ended up, but we worked hard with a target in mind. And uh, I can't recall if we actually got there, but there were a number of programs in the whole Army enterprise. It wasn't just the equipping portfolio. Everybody across the Army were, were told to go and, and look for reforms so we could fund the priorities. And so there were, it was a, another good take at everything. And I think when it comes public, you'll see we, 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 went, we went at some things pretty hard under the screening criteria that I talked about. But I won't get into the numbers. It does. If we do it again this way in the same way, it'll be harder. I describe it as an invisible line that's out there somewhere. You don't know if you've crossed it until you go to war and you don't have the equipment you need. Uh, we're closer to that now than we were maybe a couple of years, uh, 16 months ago when we started. Uh, but we're doing the analysis, looking at what areas maybe we need to take a look at putting a little bit money back into if we think we took it down too much. And so that's what we owe the leadership. They may decide to accept that risk. Uh, but that's the staff work we're doing on our end. Yes, back to Hi, the, sir. Uh, yeah. Matt Bainart, Defense Daily. Um, following up on that question, a bit, um, Senate appropriators recently in the report of their defense bill included a piece um, asking for more transparency into the night court process, uh, basically saying that, you know, maybe they, while they overall agree with, with the approach uh, that was taken, with the next budget request, they would maybe like to see a full list breaking down all the cuts. Um, so I one wanted to ask, was there a sense from the Army that although they may, you know, uh, be appreciative of the NICOR process that they wanted more transparency? Uh, and then are there any planned changes uh, to kind of match up with that uh, push to maybe be a little bit more transparent about pointing to where the cuts are? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're prepared to do all that if that's what's in the, in the and we've shared a lot of analysis uh, and described it in pretty good detail already. But I, I saw that mark, uh, that language, and so if that ends up being law, we're, we're going to do that, and we we're, we're feel pretty good about what we'll, we'll show them at that point. We've gotten requests from the other services and other the Fourth Estate folks on how the Army did the deep dive. Now that Secretary Esper is the man, okay, he's, uh, he, uh, everybody else is wanting to get smart on what the Army did. I think that's the expectation across the entire department is to clean up your own house before you start asking for money from... Uh, from the piggy bank at OSD. So um, I think, uh, you know, we have all the analysis. We've talked to them a lot in detail. We've been very transparent, I think, about why we did what we did. And we'll share the, the uh, whatever details they want uh, when it comes, when they, when they want it. Okay. Any other questions? Let's give General Pascaret a big round of applause. <laughs>